Well, we will go ahead and get started. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. It's good to be back. Um, it's very good to be back. I'm, I had every intention of being here last week, but um, I don't think you would have wanted me here last week, honestly. I think you're glad that I kept my germs to myself last week, and um, so yeah, it's KK is better. Uh, yeah, I shared my, my, my germs with her. That was not nice of me to do that, but I did, but she's better. Um, and yeah, my girls didn't come down with it, so that's good. So yeah, we're I think we're all we're all fine. So, <laughs> but I know Jason, Jason took my spot so last week. So I hope you guys were were all right with the with the B team uh, filling in for <laughs> for a week. Uh, <laughs> and that will I'm sure it'll leave the room. Somebody in here will make sure. At least I hope you will. I meant for it to get back. So you know. <laughs> No, um, no, I really appreciate him jumping in at the very last minute to, to cover for me because I was fighting trying to get here Wednesday. And then uh, he said, are you sure you want to be in a closed space with everybody if you're yeah. contagious? I was like, I, said, I don't think they'll like that. I said, I think you're right. They wouldn't. So anyway. All right, well, let's pray. And we will, we'll jump in to, uh, to our conversation tonight. Father, thank you so much for... God, for your word, and God, is this, um, this quarter we have really just been looking at just the beauty of the gospel story, God, that fills every page of scripture, uh, God, that has impact for every area of our lives, both here in the present and for all of eternity. God, would you just help us tonight as we continue, um, God, to press into our understanding of the gospel uh, God, so that we really can be more fluent in, in speaking it to others, but God, also speaking it to ourselves. So God would, no matter how long, God, we've known the story, no matter how long, God, we've been walking with you. God, I know uh, the beauty of your word, God, is that we never outgrow uh, the message of the wonder of what you have accomplished for us through your son. So God, would you tonight uh, be our teacher again and, and just through your spirit, um, refresh us, encourage us, God, convict us if necessary, uh, challenge us, uh, but God, I pray that we would all leave here equipped and, and ready to just um, live out uh, this identity that we have as your sons and daughters. So we give you praise and we thank you tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so let's review really quick. Hey, welcome. It's good to have you. I love it. Um, so yeah, let's review really quick where we have been, um, and I went ahead and left Jason's notes up from last week, so um, just to, so we can talk. We started out uh, with a week of introduction, just talking about why we need this study, why we need to be fluent in the language of the gospel, that it really is a language, and to think that way, because I think so many times there's a tendency and there's a pull in, in our Christian life to think that the gospel is something that we graduate from, right? The gospel, it's, when, it's the message we hear that we're sinners and we need to be saved and we place our faith in Jesus to be our Savior, and so we do that and then we move on and we start dealing with other things in Christianity, right? We start looking at other things in the Bible. But really, I think one of the things that we, we miss many times, and one of my hopes with this class that we're doing is to realize this story of what God is doing is something we, we don't ever graduate from, that this fills every page of Scripture, and this really has application and impact for every area of our life and every day of our life. So, so we kind of just set that tone and laid that foundation week one, and then we said we were going to spend a couple of weeks just walking through the story of the gospel and kind of breaking it up into four movements. <laughs> So that's where we've been, and so last week you filled in the whole chart that we had been working on, just thinking about if the gospel, if we're thinking of it as a language, right, and we want to be fluent in that language of the gospel, your language needs a vocabulary, right? And that vocabulary is, is framed by, by the story, right? We even, I used the example a couple of weeks ago, I just started throwing out random words, 
Um, I used winter. I used lamp. I said post. I said um, lion, right? And I just, as I said more and more words, you guys actually threw out Narnia. You threw out the lion, the witch, and the wardrobe because I was giving you vocabulary that reminded you of a story. It took all those words and it put them in the context of a story. That's kind of what we've done right here. With some of these words, they just help us remember this story of what God is doing, right? And so when we think of creation, somebody tell me quickly, when we think about creation as part of the story of the gospel, what are we talking about? Okay, God created in the beginning, and that creation was what? It was good. It was perfect. It was without sin, right? Everything worked as it should, right? What was man's relationship to God in the beginning, pre-Genesis chapter 3? It was perfect. Harmony. Right? It was, it was as God intended. But then, so then, and so we, we even threw out some words that help remind us of just, of just, of what that is, right? That God spoke it into being, right? That it was His power. That man was created in the image of God. We were designed to be His image bearers, right? That was God's intent in creation. And so we looked at these things. But then we saw the next movement in the story is the fall, Genesis chapter 3. Right? And what, what helps us describe and define that movement in the story? Separation. That's a great word right there. There's now sin caused a separation. It caused a divide. Right? That man now was spiritually what? What were we? What were, we were dead. Right? I mean, God said, the day you eat that fruit, you will surely die. And man died spiritually, right? Then we saw that they relationally they began to die. There was strife between people, right? There was there was strife between man and the land, right? There was all this death, you know, some immediate spiritually, some gradually, but death occurred, right? And brokenness occurred. Does that help us understand? our world today a little bit? And, and do you think that's important for us to, to recognize the fallenness of our world when we're thinking of just this, this language of the gospel? Do we need to know this part? Absolutely, because we need to recognize it in ourselves, right? That there's parts of us that we need to recognize that you know, we're still dealing with the results of the fall and our own sin nature, right? That like Paul says, right? You know, <laughs> this old man, who will rescue me from, from this old man of sin, right? Where it comes from, we need to recognize that we still are at war with this, right? And we daily need to die to our, to our old self and, and, walk, and walk with the Lord. Next part, though, of the story, right? It's good again. What do we see this rescue, right? What defines that? What do we understand about what God is doing from that? He did rescue us from sin. It was planned from the beginning, right? That this was always God's plan, right? From before the foundation of the world, right? That God planned to send his son to be our rescue. What other words would we use there to talk about the work of Christ for us? We, would, we could use a word like rescue. What are some other great ways for us to understand our salvation? Redemption, right? To buy us back. What are some others? Atonement. Yeah, he was, he, he was our substitute, right? He, he took our place. He was our atonement, right? thinking through these things, right? That it was all the work of Jesus, right? This rescue, did we have anything to do with this part? No, no it is nothing that we did to rescue ourselves. It's all the work of Christ and he accomplished it and he, and he fully accomplished it for us. Then we looked at this last one, this last movement, right? And these are the two you looked at last week when I wasn't here. But this idea of restoration, what, what is that all about in this movement through the gospel? The resurrection. resurrection is part of that, absolutely. Our 
Okay, there's the promise of eternal life. Freedom. There's freedom, right? That there, will, that there is coming a day, right? That Christ has already, he's already defeated sin. He's already defeated death. And, and he is returning. And there is a freedom for us as believers to know that even though we may wrestle with sin here, right? That even in this world, we may have sorrow, right? As Jesus said, we may have difficulties. He says, but take courage, right? I have overcome the world, right? He's pointing to this idea that he's going to make all things new, right? He's going to reverse the curse of sin, right? And, and restore what sin broke so that we can have that relationship with him, right? At, that, he, that he intended. So there's all kinds of things we can think about when we think about restoration. I'm looking at some of these words that you guys put down up here, right? Even, even some of that restoration, even looking at some of these words, you guys came up with some good stuff here. We get to experience part of that even as we walk with him now, right? When I look, I mean, when I look at this right here, is this a future reality or is this a present reality for us as it's present. It's present and future, right? I mean, it's got future implications, but it's but it's present. That we that we are adopted into his family, right? That we are heirs of the promise that we are being sanctified, right? Is eternal life something we have in the future or is it already ours? It's already ours, right? That's already ours. We already have the Holy Spirit. We are indwelt by him. Our identity is redeemed (laughs) um, children of God. And so all of these things show God's plan of restoration through this story of the gospel. So these are the things that make up what is, what is ours in Christ, this, this language of the gospel. And all of this is so important for what we're going to do tonight and then the next two weeks. Because now what we're going to do is we're going to take this since we're a little more comfortable with which is some of the things that are are just true because of the gospel. Now we're going to start to look at how it really applies to the everyday of our life uh, in the here and now. So that's what we're going to do. So now I am going to erase it. I saw pictures being taken, but uh, you had your chance. We're done now. Um, all right, come back, next, come back next time we do the class if you want the board again. But, you know, we may have different words up here next time, right? If we, people may think of other, other words to write down. All right, let me ask you a question um, as we get into this here. Because here's, here's really the hope. I'm going to just kind of lay all my cards out on the table here. Right, we're talking about being fluent in the gospel. You know, one of the reasons that I hope this group is, becomes very fluent in the gospel, ultimately our goal is that we become that so that we would share it, right, with those who don't know, right? I mean, I just, just full, full, full disclosure, right? I mean, I would love it if out of these next three weeks, right, we unleash a group full of people who just can't quit talking about Jesus, to everybody that you meet, and you're so fluent in the story of the gospel, and you can see ways that you can introduce the gospel story into conversation with people to show people the hope that we have in Christ, that it just, you can't help it, right? I mean, you try to cover your mouth to keep it in, and it just still comes out type of a thing. I mean, that's the goal. I mean, we want to be those people, right? We want to be, because that's obedience to what Christ has called us to do, right? To, to spread the good news of who he is, right? We're, we are to do that, right? But in order to get there, right, we've got to back up a couple of steps and we've got to make sure that we're preaching the gospel to ourselves first, right? If it's going to come out of us, it's got to be in us, Right, Because here's what I know. Here's the first thing on this here. Talking about, is the gospel good news to me? One, one really important truth here is that you talk about what you love. Would you agree with that? Yes. You talk about what you love? Um, let's see. Let's, let's start with the really easy one. Any grandparents in the room? <laughs> right? Have you talked to somebody today about your grandkids? Oh, yeah. Absolutely, right? 
Yeah. Um, parents in the room, depending on maybe, you know, stage of life with your kids or, uh, <laughs> right? You know, sometimes when they hit those teenage years, you talk about them, but it may not be in a way that, you know, <laughs> is real. <laughs> they may not appreciate it. But, um, but you, know, I, you know, one example that I've got, because I see it every day in the office, is Garrett McCord. And he's not in here, so I can pick on him a little bit, right? Um, Brand new daddy, right? Uh, just had a baby. You know, I won't say there's not a day, there's not an hour that goes by <laughs> that he's not talking about that little girl, right? I mean, we, I, I took him and our children's uh, staff, our, our, our children's team, ministry team, to Nashville for a next gen ministry conference back in uh, first of October. You know, every time we weren't in a session, you know what he was doing? looking at pictures of Leighton or FaceTiming with Leighton, right? I mean, he just couldn't quit talking about her. Why? Because he loved her, right? We talk about what we love. Well, here's something that I want us to think about is how deeply we need to be affected by the gospel, right? Not just to be saved, but to remember daily the power and the beauty of our salvation. Because the more we just soak in that, is that gonna stir our affections for Jesus to be reminded of what he did for us? That he created us, but then we, we chose to sin, right? But he didn't leave us in our sin, but chose to rescue us and to restore us, right? To just be reminded daily of the beauty of the gospel and its implications for us. Why is that so important? Because you talk about what you love, right? You absolutely do. And we could say it another way, that you love what you talk about. So think about that for a minute because that gets a little more personal, right? Like sometimes I think I have to pick my feet up and because I don't want to step on my own toes when I say that because I, if I just think back, like what are some of the things I've talked about today? If I, I mean, you know, yes, I get you talk about what you love. We all say that, right? But you know what really shows what you love? Think about what you've talked about today. Right? There's some stuff we have to talk about that's work-related or just stuff. But just think about the things that, conversations that didn't have to happen, but you made sure they happened, right? Because, you're because you want it. Yeah, because you're passionate about them, right? That kind of reveals what you love, right? So if you had been around me today, um, you probably would know something that I, that I love, and that's Tennessee football, it's Tennessee, it's University of Tennessee football. Yeah, I would, I would be happy to talk to you about that, right? <laughs> like if you wanted to know, I would tell you that the college football playoff rankings came out yesterday and Tennessee's number one. I mean, I'd be happy to talk to you about that, right? If you wanted me to, right? I mean, I haven't been able to say that for so long. It just feels good, right? I mean, next Wednesday, I probably won't be able to say that, but I can say it today, Um but you do, you, it, your words reveal what you love, yeah. right? I mean, honestly, you can't hide it because what's in there is what's going to come out. So there's a, there's a place for us to pause for just a minute and say, well, you know, because don't, you don't have to say this out loud, right? But maybe you're, as we're thinking, maybe you're processing like today's conversations and you're like, I don't know that Jesus has come up. Or I don't know that anytime I have a chance to just be talking to a group of people, right, about something that's not work-related or whatever, I don't know how often Jesus is like the first thing on my mind that, that I want to talk about. Maybe you're, you know, maybe that's a little conviction setting in like, you know, well, where, where's my love for him? Because if I don't talk about him, Right, if that's really true, right? You talk about what you love and you love what you talk about. Where, where's my love for him, right? Well, this is not a beat you up session, right? This is a, this is a point to say, because you know, our salvation's not conditional upon us, right? And so it's not to say, well, if you're not talking about Jesus, then you need to start questioning your salvation. That's not, that's not the point of this. 
the point of this is to say, but if we're not talking about him, right? What, what, what do we need? What are some things we just practically could be doing to just remind ourselves of our love for him, right? Bring like, like, you know, in Revelation where, where Paul's talking or where John's talking to the churches from the message that God has given him to the, to the seven churches and, and his message to the, to the church, right? Of Ephesus was what? You've, yeah, you've lost your first love. Right. And so that, you know, so maybe that that's one of those things like for us to stop and say, well, if that's the case. Right. If, if maybe, you know, as I've walked with him for for many years, maybe that love has just gotten a little cold. Maybe it's just become familiar and comfortable. So what should what could I do? What should I do? Right. Well, if, if we were. You know, if we were sitting in my office and it was like a marriage counseling thing, I would say, start pursuing, you know, start pursuing your spouse again, right? Start, start dating them again, right? You know, you know, go after this, right? You can't, it's not just going to happen, you know, just on its own by accident. You've got to be intentional about this. You've got to carve out time. You've got to carve out space to spend together if you want that, that romance and that, that intimacy in the relationship to be there, right? The same is true in our relationship with Christ, right? If we want, if we want to just have it be evident in us how much we love our Savior, don't you think the time we spend with Him is going to have something to do with that? So what are ways we could do that? What are... Well, you know, I think what just about everybody in the room talks to Christ every day. Mm-hmm. But maybe we are not, you know, I think my own fault here, we're not talking about him enough. Mm. We feel like we talk to him, we pray with him, we thank him, mm-hmm. but we really haven't carried it to the next level of talking to others about him. Talk. So some of it's... Uh, a discipline thing, right? That we need to just be talking about him because got to do it over and over again. Sure. You know, something that was very helpful for me um, a while back, um, and the book, that gospel fluency book that I've mentioned, that you know, some of what we're um, basing this off of, what we're doing these few weeks. Um, the the author also talks about this. He says he's just made it a, a habit in his in his just devotional life that every year he's reading a gospel. No matter what else he's reading from God's word, he is just every year like just spending time, even if it's just a few verses a day, but he is in one of the gospels all year, every year. Why? Because it's just Jesus. It's, he wants to, he goes, you know, the more time I spend looking at the life of Jesus, the more it just makes me fall in love with him. Right? And, and, and I'm going to talk about what I love. And I think that's a great, I think that's a very practical way to say, what, what's one way to just stir my affections for Jesus? Right? Reading through the Gospels is a great way to do that. Right? So there's just so thinking about those things. And then the last thing on this page here, you talk about what works. Right? We, talk, we said you talk about what you love, you love what you talk about, and you talk about what works. Right? Do, do we do that? Like if, if there's something that, you know, a product that we really like, right? You know, um, whatever that might be, right? Uh, face cream, all right? All right, give me, give me another one, all right? Because I know nothing about those. I, um, um, yeah, uh, I'm not up on my face creams and which ones work, uh, as you can probably tell. Huh? All right, favorite kind of duct tape, all right? How about cars? We got any car people in here? We got any opinions on Ford versus Chevy? Huh? <laughs> um, <laughs> right, but, but you get the point that if there's something we really like, right, brand of boots, right? Anybody got a, you know, it's, it's like there's only like a, a brand of boot that's, that's worth wearing, right, or jeans, right? I mean, we've got different things, you know, that, that we love. We talk about what works, right, because we get passionate about it. We, we've, we've used it, right, and we, we want other people to know how good this thing that we have is, right? We're good at that, right? Companies know that. 
You know, because they, they know this, that, you know, if you have a good experience, you're going to tell one or two people, right? But if you have a bad experience, you're going to tell everybody, right? And so they know we're going to talk about what works and we're going to talk about what doesn't work, right? And I think sometimes one of the reasons maybe that we, we don't talk about Jesus as much to those around us as we, sh- as we could or as we should is because we don't stop and think enough about how much the gospel is working in our everyday life. I think if we were aware of just how much what Christ has done impacts everything about us, I think we would recognize just how amazing it is on just on a completely different level, and it would be another one of those things. It's like, I can't help but tell you about Jesus, right? It's not just about eternity, right? It's not just about you get to go to heaven one day. Man, if it weren't for Jesus, if it weren't for the gospel, right, I would have I lost my kids, right? My marriage would have fallen apart, right? I probably, like my job, right? You know, he's given me the strength to be able to, 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 to navigate some tough waters with, with this or with that, right? We would start talking more about him because we would recognize how the gospel just has impacted every facet of our life because we talk about what works. Um, and I think something else is important in that is that the gospel also addresses the things in our life that, does it, that don't work. Would you agree with that? Yes. Right? Those things that are not, those habits, those hang-ups, right? Those things in our life that, are, that we just wrestle with, does the gospel speak into those two? Yeah, I mean, the, the gospel works, but the gospel, gospel also addresses the things in our life that, that don't work. And so... We could stay there all night, but I do want to keep going because there's, some, there's an exercise I want us to get to because I want, us, I want you guys to have some chances this week to do it. So we're going to keep going because I want to keep pressing into something because we're going to get there in a couple of weeks thinking about what are, what are things we need to do to where we are more apt to talk about Jesus, Right? To, to, to be able to be fluent in the gospel with ourselves and with others. So another question, right? That first question that we ask is, is the gospel good news to me? Right? And that's kind of what we just worked through. Is it? Is the gospel good news? So we got to, we, that's the first question. Next question. Why would the next question be, am I winning the battle for my mind? Why do you think we make that jump from Thinking about, you talk about what you love, you love what you talk about, and you talk about what works, right? We're thinking about just the gospel being good news, and do we really believe it? Because if we do, we're probably apt to talk about it. Why would we switch to thinking about our minds and our thoughts? Okay, there's a discipline to it. Absolutely. What else? Our mind is impacted by all the world, and the world is not in place. Okay. Absolutely. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5. As Paul's talking to the Corinthians here, he says in verse 5, we are destroying arguments and all arrogance raised against the knowledge of God. And we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What does it sound like is going on there? I mean, just thinking about that, we're destroying arguments and all arrogance raised up against the knowledge of God and we're taking every thought captive. Sounds like a battle, does Sounds like a war, right? There's a war going on. Right? Do you think there's a war going on for our minds? Absolutely, right? The devil is at war, right? You know, we, we read that, right? We don't wrestle against flesh and blood, right? But against principalities, against the powers of, of, of the devil. And so when we think about that, if the devil, if he can capture our thoughts, right? If he, if he can affect what we, the way we think, right? Then, does he con- then there's a control over what we say and what we do, right? And so 
if it, we even said this maybe, um, I don't know if Pastor Jason got there last week or not, but one of the things that I was going to talk about is that even when we think about sin, right, all sin, if we boil it down, it starts with a wrong belief, right? Think, about, think back to Genesis chapter 3, right, when Eve chose to ate the fruit and then Adam, she gave it to Adam and Adam ate the fruit. Where did that start? It started with a wrong belief about who God is, right? Satan's, you know, the serpent's question, did God really say, right? Making, making her question, God, all sin starts with the wrong belief. Where do, where, do, where do beliefs start, right? It starts in the mind, when we're, how we're thinking, right? So if our thinking is off, then ultimately everything else is too. So this idea that Paul says here is that we have to take every thought captive. I think there's, I think there's an important lesson for us that if, if we're going to speak the gospel to ourselves, if our lives are going to be impacted by this message, then it's got to start, our, we've got to think about what, how, what we're doing with our minds, what we're allowing in, right? what we're doing with those thoughts that, that fill our minds each and every day. So this first one, capture and examine your thoughts. Great question. What Does what I'm thinking line up with what is true in the gospel? Right? Do you tell yourself stuff during the day? Do you talk to yourself? It's okay to admit it, right? Do, do you talk to yourself during the day? Yeah? <laughs> Somebody's like, I don't want to admit how many times I talk to myself throughout the day. Right? Just during football games. Just during football games, yeah. <laughs> As long as you don't talk back, right? As long as you don't argue with yourself. You know, something that I think, if I were really honest, and we're going to talk a little bit more about this as we go, but I think, if we, I think if we really stop and think about it, and that's kind of what this is about, capturing and examining our thoughts, how many times we tell lies to ourselves about who we are, right? You know anybody in your life that's just completely eaten up with guilt and shame? right, regret, and I mean, it's just like, you know, almost every conversation with them, you know, you, you can see it because they, they've just told themselves so many lies about who they are, right, and they, 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 believe, they've start, they believe it, right, and it's just, it's changed almost their entire personality, right, somebody that's eaten up with bitterness, right, and unforgiveness, Right? Same kind of thing, right? They, they've told themselves lies for so long that if I just hang on to this, right, I'm, there's good, I'm gonna feel better, right? If I, can, if I just hold on, if, the, if I could just get somebody to pay, right, for what I think they've done to me and, and I get what I owe, then finally I'm gonna get freedom and relief, right, from this pain that they've caused me. Right, and, and we just we we tell ourselves those lies that those are the things that are going to help, right? And we hold on to them for so long, right? It all starts in our mind. It can start with that wrong belief. So taking those thoughts captive, and being in a great question: What does what I'm does what I'm thinking line up with what is true in the gospel? Right. Question number one is: We just think about all the things that kind of fill our thoughts. Right? The things that the voices that we're listening to, just pausing right away, right? Examining them, right? Grabbing those thoughts, putting them under the microscope, and looking at them through that lens of the gospel to say, hey, does this thing that I'm thinking, is this thing that I'm tempted to believe, is it compatible with the gospel? As we do that, it allows us to bring those thoughts into submission. What do we mean by that? If we're going to bring a thought into submission, what? That's a real churchy phrase, isn't it? All right, I'm going to bring these thoughts into submission to Jesus Christ, right? But what, what do we mean when we say that? Responsibility. Okay. Captive. Bringing them captive. Has to do with control. Taking all the pride in the way that Jesus lived, rather than according. We will we'll take what we're thinking and line it up to see like real. how it fits with what Jesus said. Mm -hmm. And if it doesn't fit, we check it. We take it away. 
Right. Yeah. It's an it's authority, right? When you bring something into submission, it's, we're talking about we're talking about authority, right? And and it's saying because we can, you know, I think we've all probably been guilty. I know I have of letting my thoughts control me, right? Let letting my thoughts, which so many times my thoughts are are kind of influenced by my feelings. Right. And so all those things all twisted and tied together. Right. And, and when all that's going on, if we let whatever has caused that thought. Right. If we let it have the authority in our lives. My goodness, the roller coaster ride we're in for. Um, right. But when we say, no, this thought has no authority. Right. I'm taking I'm taking this thought captive and I'm bringing it into submission. To Christ. Right. To look at it the way he would see it, like, like Greg, just like you said. So I gave you some questions here. We're not going to take time to walk through them because we won't get done tonight if we do. But these are some great thoughts. These are some great questions to ask yourself when you're thinking about that battle for our mind and those things that we tell ourselves. And this is all going to make a lot of sense in the end. But is this really true? Is what I'm thinking. Is it true or is it a lie? Is it from God or is it from someone else? Does this sound like the devil's accusation? Or is this the Holy Spirit convicting me? Right? Does this line up with the gospel? This thing that I'm thinking about, right? This thought in my life, right? What is it? What am I hoping in? What do I really um, hope this prom? What is this prom? What does this hope to give me? Why am I considering this behavior? In all of this, what is true of Jesus? What is true of who I am in him? So you get the picture, right? These are just some great tools to use as we think about, hey, if Satan is going after our minds, because if he, can, if he <laughs> can have control over our thoughts, right? It's, it's, it changes, you know, he's, he's got control over how we're living, how we're thinking, how we're acting. And so bringing that into submission to him is so important. This next idea as we think about our minds, how do we know what's going on in our thought lives? Well, one easy way to tell is by considering the fruit of our lives. Right? I mean, just like we said that, you know, we, we talk about what we love, right? And then we automatically start thinking of, oh, well, I love this or I love that, right? But the way we really know what we love is to flip it around and say, no, tell me what you're talking about, because <laughs> that's going to reveal, that's going to expose who you love, right? We can say, you know, we can start thinking about or talking about our thoughts, right? And those thoughts that we allow to have room in our, in our heads, right? But how do we really know the ones that we've, that we've given power to, right? That we haven't brought into submission to Jesus, right? Look at the fruit of our lives. That's going to tell you what's going on with our minds, right? Like Paul says in Romans 12, right? Don't be conformed to the image of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. How do we know if our minds are being transformed, right? By the fruit our lives are producing, honestly, right? I mean, Galatians, you can go back and look at it later, but Galatians chapter five, right? We know Galatians 5, 22 and 23, What's, what's, what's in Galatians 5, 22 and 23? Fruit of the Spirit, right? But the, the verses preceding that in verses 19 through 21, what's that the fruit of? The flesh, right? Paul, Paul's talking about what's being produced, right? And so it's, it's a mind controlled, really. I mean, it, you boil it down. It's a mind controlled by one of two things. Right? When we allow our minds to be controlled by our fleshly desires, right? When we allow Satan to, to kind of plant those doubts, plant those lies, and we believe them and we let them just kind of take root and, and start working and, and producing. Paul talks about what's going to be produced in our lives, right? This, this fruit of the flesh, right? And it's not a pretty picture, is it? I mean, listen to some of them. The deeds of the flesh are evident. 
right? Sexual immorality, impurity, indecent behavior, idolatry, witchcraft, hostility, strife, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfishness, ambition, or selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, things like that, right? All these are fruits that are produced in a life, right? Who's, where the mind is, is not, where those thoughts have not been brought into submission to Jesus Christ, right? This is a mind that's thinking, I'm looking for something else to satisfy, right? Something else to make me what, to, to give me success, to make me happy, right? To, to numb the pain, to, to make me feel whole, to make me feel powerful, to make me successful, right? All those things that we tell ourselves, those verses 19 through 21, right? That, that, this is the fruit of someone whose mind has not been transformed by the gospel, who's not seeing things through how Christ sees them. But man, look at the difference with the one whose mind is being controlled by the Spirit, who's been renewed, who's being renewed. Look at verses 22 and 23, but the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, You know, I would, I would submit to you that the person described in verses 19 through 21, what they really want are all the things in verses 22 and 23. Those are the things they're after. But the difference, the difference is their mind, their heart. Nothing has been transformed by the gospel, right? And man, how easy it is for us even as believers to slip back into old patterns, into old ways of thinking, right? And to start thinking that other things will satisfy, right? And we start settling for, for some of those cheap imitations. You know, it's, it's always good when you, you kind of get out of your comfort zone, when God kind of moves you and you have to do something that you're, you know, you're not used to doing, you get out of your routines a little bit. And so, you know, this summer, this spring and summer, I really got out of my routine uh, a little bit, you know, because I was, I was right back into youth ministry. And, you know, and I thought I had left youth ministry behind, uh, but man, was I thrown right back in there. But man, you know what a great reminder it was to me of watching, especially like the relationships, the teenage relationships, whether they were boyfriend, girlfriend type things or just friendship type things, watching how controlled, even when they knew, right? I mean, they could tell me, yes, I know that I, my worth comes from Jesus. I know that he is what should be most important to me and I should seek him first and, and that he defines me because he saved me and I'm, a, I'm his child, I'm a new creation. They can tell you all that stuff, right? But the minute you get done in a session with them, you know what they do? They start living like, nope, their worth and value comes from what friends they have or what boy likes them, right? Or if they can win on the basketball court, right? They're, they, all of a sudden, man, they just, it all goes out the window and they're consumed with finding their worth in a hundred other things. But you know what it was convicting? To realize, you know, I may not be, I may be far, far, far from being a teenager, but I still struggle with the same things. We, we all do, right? I mean, we can slip out of belief back into unbelief so easily with our actions, can't we? Um, Greg, I'm going to tell on you for just a second. Greg and I were talking about this book, the Gospel Fluency book. And, you know, at the very beginning of the book, he makes a statement that Greg was like, for when I heard it, I almost closed the book and walked away from it, right? <laughs> I did. Well, he said, I'm not a believer. You're not a believer. And, I, I, and I'm listening to this, and I'm going, oh, he doesn't know me. <laughs> who's, he, who's he writing to? <laughs> <laughs> I got to chapter 7. Yeah, that's right. Um, but, but, it is, but it is that idea, right, that, you know, as a believer, as a follower of Jesus, just to realize that we have the ability to act like an unbeliever, right? Even though our lives positionally have been transformed by the gospel, right? We've been justified. We've been declared righteous, right? We're as saved as we're ever going to be, right, because of what Jesus did for us. 
But you know, but that doesn't mean that we're not capable of going along acting like that wasn't true, right? We can slip into that unbelief sometimes and we can start to chase after stuff that we shouldn't be chasing after to give us significance, right? To, to make us feel good, to make us you know, think we can find joy and fulfillment. We can chase after those things even as believers, right? And just, and, and almost that idea of like slipping, like, you know, it's not that we're slipping from saved to unsaved, but we can go from living like we believe to living like we don't believe what we say is true. And that's what the whole point of it is. So looking at the fruit of our lives helps tell us where we are at any given time. So that's what that's about. This next one, fight with gospel truths. How do you retrain your mind? Remind yourself of the verses that tell you who you are in Christ. I would encourage you, make a list, right? Start with Romans and keep reading, okay? <laughs> And every time you see a statement that tells you something about who you are in Christ, write it down, right? And start reading it over and over and meditating on those things, right? I just wrote a few down that came to my mind this afternoon. Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. My life is hidden with Christ, Right? It's secure. My life is hidden with Christ. Philippians 1, 6, that the work God started in me, he will complete it, right? Ephesians 2, 10, I am his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works that God predestined for me to accomplish, right? I'm his workmanship, right? Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Right? That's what I'm talking about. Just writing those down as you just are reading through God's word. Every time you come to a verse that helps remind you of your identity as a child of God, just meditate on it. Right? And go back to it over and over again. Right? That's how we fight this battle for our mind is we remind ourselves of the truth of the gospel. That's what we're talking about here. All right, so last thing I want to do for just a few minutes is on this last couple, these last few pages here, all right? So do I know where the fruit comes from? These two blanks, because I know some of you will fuss at me if I don't give you the words to go in the blanks. Um, the roots of our faith produce the fruit of our life. All right, so we're going to do a little exercise here, uh, like... Fruit to root, all right? That's coming up here on another page. We're gonna look at, we're gonna look at something here. Um, and we're gonna use these questions on page 24, right? Four questions that help us examine the fruit and the root, right? The fruit and the root, looking at our lives. Because it really helps tell us what it is we're believing, right? Because if we're gonna tell, if we're gonna be fluent in the gospel with others, it's got to start with us. We've got to preach the gospel to ourselves. We're only going to do that, right, if we're thinking correctly about the gospel and we're preaching it to ourselves. So that's why we're starting here. So looking at fruit to root, four questions here, gospel-forming questions. Who is God? What has God done? Who am I in light of God's work? And how should I live in light of who I am? But the questions flipped around are really helpful when we are really trying to discern when we're walking like we don't believe. And so I'm going to show you what I mean by that, right? Um, and so I put the questions down here. So you see this next page, flip over to the next two pages where you've got two trees with a bunch of boxes on them here, okay? You got that page? You good there? All right, I'm gonna to try to recreate it here. It's not gonna be great, so just forgive me. All right, you got the two trees? All right, they're all right there. Let me give you a box right here. Um, and then I've got my little arrow right here. All right, make sure I drew it correctly. All right, so this tree, all right, let's call this tree operating in the flesh. Okay, 
This is the one that's got it backwards. All right, and I'm going to show you what I mean here. I'm going to use an example from my life, okay? And then your homework is to do this with yourself, all right? So this is going to get a little uncomfortable this week, all right? I'm not going to make you share yours, all right? I'm going to share mine, but I'm not going to make you share yours, all right? Uh, at least not right now. Um, all right, so this one, when we think about the flesh, right, when we think about this tree, we're starting with the fruit, right? Because I said we kind of look at the fruit. We examine what we're producing, what's going on, right, in our lives. Um, and so that's what we're talking about here. So here's, here's what I was wrote down that I was struggling with, okay? Because this has definitely been a battle for me in, in my life over the years. And it has at times been almost like crippling and, and paralyzing for me is the need to please people right, and the fear of what people think. Um, you know, I, I can tell you that has just at times just been, yeah, it has. It has really just about gotten the best of me at times. So in that time, what fruit would that be producing? So I, I, there's four of them up here, okay? I would say anxiousness was one I wrote down, insecurity, Right? These are the things that I would say were evident. These were fruits in my life because of just being so worried about what people thought or trying to please or win the approval of people. Right? So I'd say those are some of the fruits in my life that were evident to me. Extremely anxious, worried all the time, so insecure. Um, Paranoid, right? Every conversation that people would have, I was worried they were talking about me. It had nothing to do with me. But, but I mean, my mind had gone there. I thought every conversation was probably, I, I'd done something wrong. And so they were probably talking about me. And then burnout, right? Just lost complete joy. It wasn't that I was really working too hard. I had just lost all joy in what I was doing because of these other things in my life. Right? That's fruit that was being produced. Right? So, realizing that, right, if I, if I start backing up and try to get to the root of the problem, how did I get there? Right? How did I get there? Well, here's the questions for you to see them. I got to erase the tree in the middle of the boxes here. All right. That's a little bit better. Um, how did I get there to that fruit? First of all, let's ask this question. I was answering this, this question of who am I? You know what the answer was that was producing that? Here's who I thought I was. I, was, I thought I was not good enough, but I believed that I had to be to earn acceptance and love. That's who I thought I was, right? I believed that I wasn't good enough, but at the same time, I absolutely believed that I had to be if I was ever going to have value or worth or be good enough. So that's, who I, that's what I thought about who I was. When I think about what God has done, right, or what has God done, that's the next question. What has God done? Right that got me to there, I would say I believed that he's left me to earn my way to being valuable and worthwhile. That's why, I mean, that was, that was honestly, I mean, if I were to talk, tell you that now, I'd absolutely say, Daniel, that's a lie. And I know that's a lie. But when I was, when this was the fruit being produced, what I was really believing was that God had left me to have to earn it, to have to work for his love and his approval and therefore the approval and value and, and, and worth, you know, or significance from other people, right? I thought that's what God had done. I really thought God had kind of left me to, to deal with it on my own. That's, that was what was being produced, right? What would I have said in this moment about who God is, right? This is the next one. We're working our way down here. In this moment, 
with this, the fruit being produced, what would I have said about who God is? Right? Well, what this was showing is that I believed that God's love was conditional, that I believed God could change, that he was temperamental, right? That he could feel one way about me, but then based on my actions, right, or my performance, he could feel another way about me, right? That's, that's, those are the things that were being produced, right? And so, so, does that make, so if we go down here and we realize if I, if I was thinking this, right, and then that caused me to think this about what God had done, and then that showed me, that told me about, you know, who I thought I was, you see how all of that ends up leading to, a, to fruit like this being produced? Does that, does that make sense that that could happen? Okay. All right. So what goes in this box here, right? We were just talking about, all right, in order to deal with this, right, we've got to talk about confession, confession of sin, right? Because with this fruit, if we're going to deal with this fruit, right, because there's nothing healthy about this, right? Do I really believe that God's love is conditional? Do I know that that's not true? Right. Do I really believe God has abandoned me to just have to work for it myself, to earn his love? Do I believe that? No, I was acting like I did, but I didn't. Right. With who I am, do I really believe that I am not good enough and that um, I have to earn acceptance and love. I know better, right? But it's very easy, right, to get there and then for this to be what is produced, right? I mean, I can tell you that allowing those thoughts, not taking those thoughts captive, right, not bringing those thoughts into submission, honestly and truly, there were moments where I thought I needed to just get out of ministry, right? I thought I was absolutely of no good to churches, to the Lord, and I had no business doing it. I mean, that's really what that could have, was at times producing. I thought I needed to just throw in the towel and go do something else. But you know what? I love this word. You can't see it? Oh, you can't see it from my book, can you? Repentance. Sorry. <laughs> I need a better marker. All right. Because repentance. Because this, this is, this is thinking in the flesh, right? That's operating that way. But there's a whole another way that we could look at this, right? So let's, let's draw it over here again. All right. Time, I've still got a, I got a few minutes. I'm working on my time here, so. All right. Very good. All right. Here we're over here, we're acknowledging the sin that in our lives. But on this one here, if repentance, if we truly recognize this, right, we're bringing these thoughts captive, right? Let's start down here, right? We Repentance, I'm going to put that, whoa, that's a much better marker. There we go. All right? Here, right, this is confessing our sin. Over here, we're confessing our faith, right? We're not allowing our emotions to dictate what is true of us, Right? We're starting with our faith. We're starting with what we know, what we believe to be true about God, and we're letting that inform our thoughts and our feelings. So, who is God? So we're starting down here. Instead of starting up here and letting this inform everything below it, we're starting at the root, and we're letting it inform the fruit, right? Does that make sense? So who is God? If I had started there, what would I have said? His love is unconditional, that he is a loving father who wants good for his children, right? That he is powerful, that he is in control, that he is unchanging, 
right? If we start there, right? That's what, that's what's true of who God is. Well, what's true? Let's move up to the next question. What has God done? Did he send his son to pay for my sin because I wasn't good enough? But because he chose to, I didn't have to earn it, right? He chose to freely give his son to redeem me, to clothe me in his righteousness, Right? It's not a performance-based thing. Right? What has God done? He has accepted me because of the work of His Son, because of the shed blood of Jesus. That's where my acceptance comes from. Right? That's what He has done. So who am I? Right? If I'll keep working my way up. So who am I? Yeah. I'm a child of God. I'm accepted. Right? I'm I'm part of his family. I'm adopted into the family of God. Can I lose that status? Did I earn that status? Absolutely not. It was a free gift of God of his choosing. That's who I am. And so when I start here with who God is, And then I think about what God has done. And then I let those things inform what I think about myself. What kind of fruit do you think that produces? It doesn't produce this. I can tell you that. (laughs) I understand that I'm loved. Right? There is a joy in serving the Lord. Because now I'm not doing it to earn the approval of man. I'm not doing it to feel significant or worthy. I'm doing it out of a joy because of who God is and what He's done and because of what that has, because of what that then has given me. So there's joy, right? I'm not anxious, right? There's a peace that I experience. And my goodness, Right? There's a hope. Because, you know, I still battle, right? Wanting people to like me, right? I still battle that. I want everybody to like me. Um, I hate hard conversations, right? Oh, my goodness. I mean, you want to just, you know, kill me, is make me, make me sit down and have to have a really hard conversation. I hate, I hate it. I hate tension. I hate hard conversations. But, you know, but when I let, my understanding of who God is and what He's done inform my understanding of who I am, you know what I can do? I can have hard conversations because I understand the hope of the gospel means that reconciliation is possible. It lets me know that forgiveness is possible. It lets me know that people can change. There can be transformation that happens. So sometimes it's worth it. You got to have hard conversations because it produces good fruit on the other side, right? And whether, whether or not that happens, my worth is not attached to it anymore because I know my worth comes from Him. You see the difference in the two? You think that's a big difference? So let me ask you this. And this one, by the way, that's walking in the Spirit, right? So... So let me ask you this then before we go. How many times do you, is this more the pattern of, of, your, of, of how you live sometimes, right? You start, you start with just the eyes on the flesh, the eyes on the circumstances, right? And you get so consumed with what you're feeling and what you're thinking <laughs> and the circumstances around you that it works from the fruit down to the root and you end up believing something Honest living like something is true about God, that's absolutely not, right? Have, have you been there? Yeah. Right? Is it easy to slip into there? Yeah. All the time? Yeah, it's, all, it's easy to do, right? Because Satan's always battling for control of our minds. But my goodness, what's the solution? It's, it's repent. It's a change, right? A change in thinking, a change in direction, 
right? That's what repentance means. It means an about face. It means to go in the other direction. And so if we go in the other direction, literally, right, and we start with, okay, I realize if this is what's being produced in my life, that, has, that looks nothing like the fruit of the Spirit. So that ought to be that moment where we, we take that thought captive, we bring it into submission, and then this is how we do it. Wait a minute. What do I know to be true of who God is? Meditate on that. What, what has God done? Let me meditate on that. Based on that, what does that say about who I am as his child who's been saved, who's been adopted into his family? And then from this understanding... Let that produce a fruit in us, right? But it takes a discipline, right? It takes practice, right? It takes being fluent in the language of the gospel to be able to do that, right? It takes knowing our Bible and learning what, what, what the Word of God says about what's true of us because of what Jesus has done and because of who He is. So what I would love for us to do this week. You've got in your book, I hope you kind of took notes on my scribble there on those first two trees. But if you'll flip the page, you've got two more trees. <laughs> All right. So I bet you can guess what your homework is. I want you to do the uncomfortable exercise that I just did in front of you this week. And I want you to pick an area where you can slip into unbelief sometimes. And maybe times you've seen in your life where, where you could identify with, with an area in your life where, man, it's, there's been a fruit produced in your life that really is the result of just some backwards <laughs> thinking, right? And I want you to do it. I want you to think, okay, when this was the fruit being produced in my life, work your way down, right? What did that make me think about who I was? What did that make me think about what God had done? And what did that ultimately make me think about who God was, Right? But then stop and think, but if I were to repent of that thinking and I were to start down here and let who God is inform and remind me of what he's done and then let that inform my understanding of my identity, what fruit would be produced then, right? Work through that exercise in your own life, right? And just, it, it'll be healthy. It'll be uncomfortable, but it'll be healthy, okay? I mean... <laughs> It'll be good. And if the questions, if you didn't get them written down, right, the questions are on that page, okay? Like these, these, these questions that I wrote, these four gospel-forming questions, right? That, those are the questions, They're basically. I just wrote them a little short, in a shortened version. But I would love this week for you just to do that because it will help remind you what we mean when we say, preach the gospel to yourself. This is what we're talking about. Because if we can... If our minds can be transformed, if our minds can be renewed, then that's going to produce a fruit in us, right? That will, that will spill over into what we're going to talk about next week, which is our relationships with each other, right? How we're fluent in the gospel as a community of believers. Because then as we think about that, that final piece is then how we as a community of believers are fluent with the gospel to the world that doesn't know him. So that's where we're going, but it had to start personal. So this week we got to do some of that personal work and think about it a little bit, okay? Can we do that? I don't see a whole lot of enthusiasm for that. <laughs> it's scary? Good. All right, good. It's a little scary. <laughs> like, I'm not coming back to your class anymore. <laughs> that's no fun. We're not, I don't want to do this, so... Oh, my goodness. But you know how freeing, honestly, that is, though? It's, it is, right? Because here's the thing. Even writing out some of these very uncomfortable things, you know, it was such a good reminder that God already knew. <laughs> I didn't take him by surprise, right? It didn't scare him away, it, but it was good for me to recognize it. So, all right, I'm going to let you go. I've kept you way too long.